Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're broadcasting from tonight. We, repay, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Welcome back to UQ Talks, the series designed to ignite your curiosity by giving you access to some of the brightest minds at your university. I'm Tegan Taylor, I'm a journalist with ABC Radio National and I'm your host and moderator for this series. Tonight I am joined by leading UQ researchers who are here to help us grasp the urgency around climate change. What does net zero look like? Are green products really clean? We'll be discussing what needs to be done in the critical mining and agriculture sectors as they're two of the biggest contributors for emissions. Before I introduce our speakers, a reminder that this is your talk and you can be part of the discussion by asking your questions using the Q&A button on your screen as we go tonight. Thank you so much to those who submitted some terrific questions in advance. So joining me on the panel tonight are Associate Professor Simon Smart, who's UQ's project lead for the Net Zero Australia project. Simon's research is centred around the sustainable production and use of energy and chemicals and Professor Ben Hayes, who's a co-inventor of genomic prediction, which is now being used in livestock and crops to predict future trait outcomes, including for methane emissions from cattle. Our third panelist is Dr. Vicky Sharma. She leads UQ's Center for Social Responsibility in Mining's work on fossil fuel transitions, particularly looking at the social, political, and economic impacts of coal phase out in India, China, and Australia, you may notice that Vigya is not here in the room tonight. She's not able to join us in person. She is out putting her money where her mouth is, attending an energy transition dialogue in Delhi. However, I was lucky enough to sit down with Dr. Vigya Sharma earlier to hear her perspectives from the mining sector. So I'll be sharing some of the insights throughout the talk tonight. I might actually start off with one from her. When we're talking about the urgency of climate change, how does that manifest for you in the sorts of areas you're working in? The scale is unprecedented um, and the, the pressure of time is something we, as a humanity, we have never dealt with. So it's really, it's, it's really quite serious. But for me personally working in the sort of the mining space, I believe it's full of challenges and we need to be very considerate and careful about how we source the minerals that are going to feed into these new technologies. Um, there is a lot of conversation around how green and clean they are, um, and I'd like to urge a caution there, and it, they're not necessarily all that clean because there's a huge mineral footprint, um, you know, from a land perspective, from um, conflict with other land users perspective, but equally from the perspective of those local communities which are at the you know, which are living and dependent often on the land and, and air and water um, at the source of production or extraction of these resources. So we have to be very careful about what happens to those communities which may have not seen mining at the scale that we are talking about going into the future. So I basically asked Vigia to tell me how the urgency of climate change is manifesting in her sphere and that's what she said. Ben, how is it manifesting for you in the ag sector? So I think agriculture, well, and uh, it's responsible for about 17% of Australia's emissions. That's actually rising as some of the other sectors um, start to do things to pull their emissions down. So the pressure is coming on ag to really start getting those emissions down in a couple of different ways. But one of the most important ones is ag is a really export focused industry in this country and our markets are going to start demanding a lower carbon footprint on agricultural commodities like our wheat and beef and so on. Yes, yeah, so, so there's an economic pressure there. There's a real economic pressure coming as well, yep. How about you, Simon? Um, so I, I guess for us, we, we were responsible for the Net Zero Australia study. Um, one of the things that came out of that, and I sort of echo some of Vigu's comments, was that um, the, this, the pace and scale of what's required as we get to as we look towards net zero, uh, both for uh, uh, our national economy, but then also for our exports, which don't just include agriculture, but also all of our mining and, and most important of all, our fossil fuel exports. 
the pace and scale is just, um, it's unprecedented. We haven't seen anything like it in the past. And, um, and so that's, uh, it, it's a really challenging space uh, for us, full of opportunity as well as, as we move um, to, to different industries, to new industries open up, but then challenges as different communities and, and other industries start to, to ramp or phase down. I mean, the, the title of this talk that people clicked on when they agreed to come was It's Not Too Late to Save the Planet. Uh, was it false advertising? No, no, it's not. Um, and that was one of the really positive outcomes from our work actually was, was actually being able to show what are several different... So we use scenarios, so not, not sort of forecasts or predictions of the future, but here is a possible future world and here's the pathway that we might go down in order to get to that possible future world. And all of those possible future worlds were net zero for Australia by 2050 for our national economy and 2060 for our exports. Um, and all were possible. Um, we were able to, to, to show that, yeah, it is, it is possible to do. It's not, it's, so, it's not false advertising. Well, that's a relief. We'll dig into the details of that in a minute. But I do want to turn back to agriculture because in addition to being a big emitter, it's also really at the forefront. I've got to stop myself from saying coalface <laughs> in a chat like this. But it's at the forefront of feeling the effects of climate change as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, farmers see that all the time, bushfires. There's bushfires all over Queensland at the moment and it's really hitting them pretty hard. So I, my dealing with farmers and agricultural companies, they're really feeling the need to do something about this. Um, I'm very encouraged by that. Yeah, I think there's maybe a perception that industry is resistant to this sort of change, but you're saying, at least in your sector, they're really on board? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're putting a, a very large grant together at the moment to map out the pathway similar to the work Simon's doing um, for agriculture specifically to get to net zero. And we had um, 72 industry groups sign up with very little um, work by our, ourselves. They were very willing to come on board. So that was great. Simon? Um, yeah, look, uh, and, and I suppose being a chemical engineer, my experience is probably more with the, with the coal face, almost literally, um, in terms of oil and gas companies and minerals companies and, and, and heavy industry. And there is a, there's a clear realisation um, that something needs to change and that actions need to be taken. There's also a strong realisation in a lot of sectors that there are big opportunities there through this transition. So I think, um, I think a lot of the moves that have been made and the language is changing over the last five years for sure, um, becoming much more positive in terms of, and much more action focused as opposed to, um, yeah, maybe some of the sort of more vague statements that might've come through in the past. I mean, the idea of net zero by 2050, it's almost like a slogan at this stage. It's, and when you say it in one mm. sentence, it's like, yeah, we'll just simply get to net zero by 2050. Mm. I'd really love to kind of articulate the complexity that lies underneath that, Simon. That's really what your work's all about. Yeah, it is. It's, um, and it takes a, a, a lot longer than just a couple of moments here on, on this. And so I'd really No, I'm encourage... pretty sure we're going to fix it within the next hour. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of detail behind our study, but I guess... Um, some of the, the highlights that come out is that, so one, it is possible, um, both uh, domestically and there's, there's a real opportunity there for us to transform our fossil exports into some sort of clean energy carrier. Um, but there are some, it's a, as I said, transformation at pace and scale that we haven't seen previously. Um, so part of our study actually mapped out where is the lowest cost place what infrastructure do we need and where is the lowest cost place to put it around Australia, almost down to sort of a 10 by 10 kilometre grid. Um, and the maps that we produced are quite startling. We see that there are um, uh, these solar farms that are almost the size of Tasmania in some instances that sort of span across the northern parts of our country uh, in that sort of northern sunbelt there, um, dedicated to export sort of replacing our fossil fuels. There's, there's you know, going from 100,000 to 800,000 new workers uh, across the, the 40 years of the transition. There's, you know, seven to $9 trillion of capital that's sort of required for investment, both a lot of that for export, some of that for, um, for, the, for the national picture. Um, and then, you know, all the way down to how does, um, how do residences, households, businesses, what, what does change look like for them from, 
you know, simply changing out cooktops through to, you know, EV purchases, so putting solar and batteries in their homes. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the pace and scale at all, at all of it is the thing that comes home to, to us and to, to me personally, um, but still possible. Seven to nine trillion dollars is such a massive number. I don't even know what what does that buy? Like, what's the yeah. equivalent of? I don't even know what our like it's, national it's, spending is. It's a number that's that's yeah, it's beyond sort of the realms of my <laughs> comprehension. But I guess what it does do is it creates an, a, a renewable electricity system that's on the order of about um, sixty times what we have today. Um, so that's, as I said, these solar farms the size of Tasmania, about five or six of them spanning the north, um, massively upgraded transmission infrastructure, wind farms, offshore wind farms, um, and then all of the change that it accompanies, you know, us buying EVs, us, you know, uh, building energy efficiency improvements, a lot of the agriculture changes that need to happen as well, um, heavy industry change to be able to capture some of those carbon uh, emissions and lock them underground. Uh, as part of CCS, so it's it's basically it buys an entirely new economy, basically. Oh, the bargain, uh, CCS being carbon capture and storage, which yes. we will come to in a minute. But you know, you're talking about things that are the size of Tasmania. We're talking about land use. Mm. I know an industry that uses a lot of land. How does these? How does this intersect with agriculture? Yeah, I think there is uh, really good possibilities for an intersect there, and out at our Gatton UQ Gatton campus. They're actually grazing sheep under solar cells, and that has some advantages for the sheep, like when they're lambing, they're more protected and so on. So you can, you can start to think about integrating renewable energy and farming. It really feels like kind of one of the oldest industries that we have and the newest we have like in harmony with each other. It's very wholesome. Yes, yes. No, there are lots of possibilities there and hydrogen for tractors and harvesters and so on. Yeah. yeah, but it's another industry that's really complex to kind of bring these in. It's an industry that's quite fragmented because it's a lot of small farms versus a couple of really big mining companies, for instance. Yep. Can you yep. talk me through like how those challenges manifest and how we might overcome them? Yes, yeah, so that is a challenge. And I think what we've discovered in agriculture is if we bring in technologies to reduce emissions, they also have to increase the profit for the farmers, or at least they can't go backwards. Otherwise, these family farms and so on just aren't going to adopt the technologies. But luckily, quite a few of the things we can do to reduce emissions um, are profitable for the farmers. For example, if you improve feed conversion efficiency, how much feed you need to produce a kilo of beef, that also reduces methane emissions. So that's a win-win right there. How do you scale those sorts of small interventions? Like it is, it's a marginal gain that adds up to something really big over the course of yeah. a whole industry. How, how, how do you scale it? So the model we're looking at using is demonstration farms where we work with our friends in industry and actually put these technologies on farm and observe over time how the farmers are actually using them, their effect on profit, we can measure their effect on emissions as well. And the great advantage of doing that is if you do something on farm, their neighbours can see it, farmer groups can visit those demonstration sites. In ag, it's a really effective model for driving adoption. And how does, within agriculture, such a, a massive um, variation in climates across Australia the innovations that you're sort of bringing in, how are they able to be deployed in the northwest versus somewhere like Tassie? Yeah, yeah. So in uh, relatively small farms like dairy, where you feed the animals in a trough every day, it's relatively straightforward. You can add things to the feed that reduce methane. Where the big challenge is, is up north. Mm -hmm. These huge properties where you have a, an animal per every couple of hectares or something, how do you deliver something that's going to reduce the methane of that animal? And that's in a way that isn't creating more greenhouse gas to just get yeah, it there. Yeah, just yeah, getting yeah. there, just driving the truck out. Um, so that's what we're actually working on here at UQ. We've got a few different strategies, like there's genetic variation in how much methane cattle emit, so we can select for lower methane. Mm. Um, we've got other technology, which is a biopolymer bolus that you can put in the animal and it can reduce 
methane mitigating substances. What, they swallow like a ball of something? J just a small ball of, pl it's biodegradable polymer. And yeah, it's, it's looking like being quite an effective technology. So that's together with the engineering department here at UQ. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. nice use of technology. So of course this conversation is about net zero, which is all about the climate, the planet, saving the planet, but it's not the only metric by which we sort of look at the environment and the, the health of the planet and the, our ability to live happily on it. How do our efforts towards net zero interact with things like still preserving biodiversity or traditional owners' access to and use of their own land? Simon? Yeah, that, they're two great questions and two things that we were really cognizant of when we when we um, embarked on the study and, and the complexity of those things sort of just compounded as, as we got further into it and understood more because we're largely a group of simple engineers. Um, <laughs> um, and so from, from the biodiversity aspect, um, yeah, we want to be really careful that what we're doing, uh, I guess the... the the simple way of phrasing it, or perhaps the uh, yeah, maybe the simple way of phrasing it is that we don't want to solve the climate crisis and and exacerbate the biodiversity crisis, right? So, when we start and the technologies that we need or that we will likely use, um, like solar panels, wind farms, they take up a lot of land. They sit in they're best placed in terms of where are the best resources in areas where people aren't normally there and where there's lots of sort of untouched wilderness or biodiversity. And so we don't want to have, you know, there's this tension between, okay, well, we need this infrastructure in order to provide the energy for Australia in a, in a carbon-free way. And, and also, you know, Australia's got a large responsibility in terms of um, decarbonize, potentially decarbonizing other countries in terms of our exports. Um, so how, how do we balance that against um, degrading uh, sort of pristine environments as well. And so we were, we tried to be really careful in terms of the way in which we thought about making sure that we didn't create any additional sort of extinction events or, you know, really push into areas where there were critically endangered or endangered habitats or ecosystems. Um, but there's a lot more work that, that can be done there and be really excited in the sort of the next phase of the project to, to expand on that. And then in terms of the First Nations communities, what, when we overlay our, all of our infrastructure maps against um, the maps of what I'll call Indigenous estate, which sort of is more broad than just, I guess, what most folks would see as native title, but it, it is sort of both Indigenous managed, owned, and, and some of the protected areas as well. Um, something like 45% of the infrastructure sits on land that's categorized as indigenous estate. So that's clearly a, a really, really important question and, and discussion, I should say, rather than question that needs to happen as we go through this uh, energy transition so that we don't sort of end up making the same mistakes that we've made in, from the, the extractive industries, which are more, I'm more familiar with, uh, and the heavy industries that I'm more familiar with have, have made, you know, it, through the past. So that's a really important discussion that has to happen. Yeah. Can, can I just add something oh, yeah. there? Because I think there's, um, as you alluded to, some great opportunities there. And there's some, for example, there's some evidence emerging that some of our native grasses and shrubs have anti-methanogenic compounds. Anti, so not creating methane. In so when you feed them to cattle and sheep, the methane is reduced. And just to give you an example of one of these tannin that you get out of tea yeah. and is in lots of other plants as well, that reduces methane when you feed it to livestock. So if we can find native shrubs with tannin and grasses with compounds, we can actually do a screening process to see which ones are most effective at reducing methane, working with, of course, our indigenous communities that are custodians of those grasses and shrubs. So that's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, so there are massive challenges but we're not starting from a standstill. And I suppose there's roles that all the different industries can play. And to explore what changes uh, are already happening within these key industries, I actually asked Vigya about that, specifically about mining. What's the role of the mining industry in reducing carbon in its operations and then also contributing to be part of the solution? 
There's a significant role for mining industry because obviously there is a, uh, they are a significant contributor to the global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I believe that the industry is taking it seriously and, and the big players at least, so you know, the top five of the six mining companies in the world are taking really um, systematic efforts to cut back on their scope one and two emissions, which is the emissions that they produce in the extraction and processing um, of resources. Uh, for example, I know that Rio Tinto has just recently signed um, a billion dollar or perhaps more renewable energy production project um, in Australia, uh, which is to do exactly that, cut back on there. So they're going to source power from that project. Uh, this is going to be a combined wind, solar and battery storage project in the first phase. Um, and Rio Tinto is going to source energy from them to be able to cut back its emissions from its spillbury operations on, for iron ore. So there are similar, um, I mean, Anglo-American is doing a number of things, likewise to many other um, companies worldwide. But, but we're still only talking about scope, scope one and two. So scope three emissions is when the product is exported and the company is not responsible anymore for its production, uh, for its emissions. So I think there's not much progress on that front yet. I'll just get a quick definition from you, actually, Simon, on what we're talking about. Vicky talked about scope one, two, and three in the mining industry. What does that actually mean? So scope one emissions are those sorts of emissions that would be produced directly on the mine site as part of their operations. So that might be things like uh, burning diesel as part of their trucks, uh, the, the, you know, the trucks that are operating inside the mine. Scope two emissions are the ones associated with their electricity use. So when they're connected to the electricity grid, that electricity will have some form of, you know, some renewables in it, some coal, some gas. It will have an emissions intensity um, that's scope two emissions. And scope three emissions are sort of, um, I guess, they're harder to categorize and, and I'll, I'll put them more in terms of supply chain emissions. Mm. So they're the ones that, um, so if I'm buying a steel product from you, then um, the emissions associated with bringing that steel product to me are, um, yeah, they're, they're the scope three emissions of the company that's selling me the product. So um, scope one and two are much more easy to control for companies because they're directly responsible for where they get their power from and what they do on site. Um, scope three is much more of a supply chain question and there's, there's issues as to where responsibility for one stops and the next starts. It really speaks to how interconnected mm. these industries are and if we're going to cut down on emissions, it really has to be a joint effort. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's also another opportunity though, for example, with the, the beef supply chain, mm. uh, the farmer, his cattle emit methane, that's his scope one emissions. But when Coles buys that beef, that's their scope three. Mm -hmm. So they're pushing hard to reduce that. So they're wanting to get carbon footprints from the farmers so they can categorize their scope three. And that drives across the supply chain, a reduction in emissions. To be able to categorise that, you have to be able to measure and report on that. What goes into calculating the carbon footprint of a stake or a piece of steel? So for a stake at the moment, it's just this cow is this many kilograms and you multiply it by the number of kilograms of methane you expect it to emit and then multiply by uh, the CO2 equivalents, which is about uh, 28 Methane has a global warming potential, which is 28 times a kilogram of CO2. Yeah, that's so that's the calculation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly the calculation that's done. Mm -hmm. Over time, we're going to get more precise because we'll know more about what the vegetation's doing, what different genetics of animals is doing and so on. But at the moment, that's the way it's done, essentially. Yeah, I think uh, in the heavy industries, it's probably a little more categorized because they're all, they have to report their emissions a little more thoroughly. Um, and so that they'll be able to, it's still basically done through uh, emissions factors and, and, and so on, but there's probably a little bit more of a handle on uh, precisely what uh, is, is happening on the plant because more things are measured and it's stationary. It's not roaming around a paddock somewhere and, um, you know, there's only a few of them as opposed to the heterogeneity of a, of a herd or something along those lines. So, but it's, it's the same basic principles. It's just um, maybe the measurement of some of the you know, steel plants or cement plants or coal mines is a bit better. 
So part of the solution to cutting carbon is actually measuring it and being able to report on it at all. Yes. Specifically for the agriculture industry, though, it's not just about reducing the emissions of that industry. It's potentially, if we're getting to net zero, offsetting other industries. Yes, that's a very is interesting it? question. And uh, this is an opinion of mine and some other people, but I, I think initially there was great promise that ag might be able to offset a lot of emissions from other industries through planting vegetation and so Simon's on. Simon's sitting here hoping that you still can. Uh, yep. But I think over time, once you factor in things like methane emissions and the, the emissions of the whole farming system, that looks, let's say, just a little bit less exciting. And certainly some agricultural businesses are just going to have to hang on to their carbon credits to offset their own emissions. So there's still some potential there, particularly where it rains a lot. But in this country, it doesn't rain a lot in quite a lot of the country. It's raining even less at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have to factor in things like droughts. You're going to get droughts. Mm -hmm. So you have to do your budgeting over drought years and good years. Otherwise, you get a bit trapped. So unfortunately, I think that's not the absolute answer that agriculture is going to offset making steel, for example. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And our research would, would, would agree with that as well, actually. So we, we looked at what our study was, was supposed to be uh, economy wide. And so we actually looked at the, the land use, land use change, uh, waste and forestry sectors. So encompassing ag and, and other ones as well. And when we look at all of the possible things that we can do from stopping land clearing entirely through to all of the amazing technological interventions that uh, Ben's talking about, um, is we still found that Australia, because of what we are and our arid nature, was unlikely to reach net zero in, the ag, in that space. So the idea that the, these industries would be able to provide offsets into other industries, the, the really hard to decarbonise ones that, you know, cement and steel and heavy industry and, and the like, um, it, it's really challenging. We don't see that that's the case. Um, or at least that there's a lot of uncertainty around that and that um, actually one of the things where research would really, really help is better characterising what we can do um, for some of those deep soil carbon things, whole of rangeland restoration things that would also then have some of those nature positive benefits around biodiversity and the like that we were talking about earlier. We've sort of been talking obliquely about Australia, like we're in it mm. and the research that you're doing is primarily in it and modelling it. Um, I'd love to talk about Australia's role in what is a global problem. Um, this is actually something I asked Vidya about, which I'll, I'll let her explain. It's a global problem. Mm -hmm. What does Australia's action look like here? Because we are such a mining intensive country. Um, so Australia is going to see some critical shifts in its land use in demographic, uh, demographic shifts um, over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, a lot of the coal assets, obviously, um, thermal coal assets will close, and sh rightly so. Uh, however, there is a strong differentiation here between thermal and met coal. So met coal in Australia, which is the steel making coal, is not going to go away for at least the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, that's what I believe, looking at numbers of, you know, how current met coal operations are going. Um, so, and, and Australia is the largest met coal exporter. So it's a critical export revenue generator for Australia. And the world is going to need more steel. Um, um, you know, countries in East Asia, India, China, they will continue to uh, require Australia's met coal. So, so met coal is not going to go away imminently, but thermal coal is and should. Um, and, but, and then Australia is obviously having, going to be um, looking at opening new lithium mines, new um, nickel, cobalt, copper uh, mining operations. This would mean that regions that have typically been or traditionally been coal regions may not have the mining activity at the scale that they're used to, which would mean migra migration um, you know, to new regions bringing in challenges that we all know that these migration, large-scale migration patterns bring. There is going to be more and more uh, focus on solar and wind, which we are already seeing across Australia, um, entering into on indigenous lands. So there's going to be more and more partnerships between companies 
and indigenous organizations, or should be. We are not seeing enough of them yet, but there are some big partnerships that have come up between private companies and indigenous ownership, um, Aboriginal corporations, which are talking about co-ownership of indigenous peoples within that operation. And that's a great, great step. It's something that is long time coming, basically. So there are going to be some positive shifts um, as Australia pivots to critical minerals, but there are going to be some very significant impacts on the land and impacts on social fabric of the community. Um, and I think the government needs to be just mindful of those changes as it drafts its policy forward. I can see you both nodding furiously as she's speaking. Ben, your thoughts? Yeah, so I think because agriculture is an important part of Australia's economy compared to some other countries, we've actually been a bit of a leader in this space. For example, um, people might be familiar with stories about feeding seaweed to cattle that reduces emissions. That was an Australian invention. Uh, we do work with international colleagues very actively on this problem, uh, and that, that's great, that helps. I would say the production systems are pretty different. If you go to some countries in Europe, you don't see many cattle, you just see a lot of barns, and the cattle are actually inside the barns, and that makes it easy to just feed them something every day that reduces methane. Whereas as we talked about before, a lot of our cattle are out in the rangelands. So we do need some unique solutions, but we are very tapped into uh, what's happening overseas. And I think agriculture has a good history of adapting and adopting very quickly what's going on in the rest of the world and technology from other sectors like medicine and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Simon? Uh, yeah, look, Vigya touched on a couple of different points there, actually. And, and so in terms of the mining sector, I, I, I completely agree. I think there's um, lots of opportunities to, for us to consider what, uh, what what the net zero transition will mean for Australia, both like as in what critical metals and minerals will we need um, that could be produced on Australian shores, um, but then also uh, what will the rest of the world need? Um, and the answer is, in both cases, a lot uh, and growing. And Australia is blessed with um, not only great renewable resources and in the past great fossil resources, but also with great resources in these critical mineral, uh, minerals and metals. Um, so there's tremendous opportunity there. Um, and I'd echo her comments too around the opportunities for, for you know, equity sharing and co-ownership and, and uh, new partnerships in terms of the way in which um, First Nations uh, people interact with these projects, um, both with energy and with the mining space. And there's, there's beginning to be some, some, so in the energy space, the First Nations Clean Energy Network has some great guiding principles around how to start to develop some of these projects so that um, some of those principles of, of equity sharing and co-ownership co um, and benefit sharing really come through. I'd love to come back to critical minerals though, specifically, because mm. there is this sort of uh, down payment for if you want to have battery power and you want to have renewable, you know, electric cars and all that sort of thing, you need minerals that need to come out of the ground, yeah. um, which is kind of an ugly process, but it's sort of got a, a long-term goal. Where's the cost benefit and what goes into that cost benefit analysis? Yeah, again, a really great question. I think that, so, um, it, it, and it's often sort of posed in terms of um, local negative impacts, local negative environmental and potentially local negative community impacts if not managed well um, for global good, um, which is maybe not the best framing that we need going forward. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of like just the straight up, is it worth from a carbon benefit perspective pulling the stuff out of the ground to install the batteries and do all the processing to, to make the batteries and then install them? The short answer is yes. It, it always comes out ahead uh, in terms of just the, sh the pure carbon reduction benefit. Um, but we do have to be really careful about how we develop those resources and reserves so that uh, and the way in which we process them um, so that we avoid a lot of those sort of negative uh, uh, local impacts. Um, yeah. And then the other question that comes up a lot with the agri agriculture industry when we're talking about the carbon footprint of food is beef is thirsty and, and greenhouse intensive and is a solution going, well, we don't eat beef anymore. We only eat soy. 
<laughs> or, or something. So it has its own problems, but um, just to go back a little bit, uh, the reason our ancestors domesticated cattle and sheep was because they do this amazing trick of turning low quality grass or low quality shrubs into very nutritious meat and milk. So that's why we have cattle and sheep. They still do that, of course. And a lot of our, uh, like Western Queensland, Northern Territory, WA, is very low quality um, grass and so on. You can't grow crops there or anything else. What you can do is produce beef cattle there. On the other side, as you pointed out, they produce methane. So there is a trade-off there between having very good uh, nutritious food, particularly if you think about our role as an exporter um, and providing food security to not just Australia, but to other countries. And some of those countries need meat more than that we do, because they have very low amounts of meat in their diet and a little bit more would actually help kids get more iron and zinc and so on. So there is a trade-off there. I think the answer is really though, we just have to get our beef industry to be much lower in emissions through these new technologies that are coming through. If we can do that, we can still take advantage of this um, wonderful ability they have to turn that low quality grass into great nutrition. Also the plants we grow aren't completely carbon neutral either. No, that's exactly right. Soy is a really interesting one. We've, we've got a project. <laughs> sorry, soy. Sorry. And sorry, B. We just got a project on this, one of my colleagues did. And that whole project is about replacing soy in chicken feed and pig feed. And the motivation behind that is the chicken and pig companies don't want to be getting soy from Brazil and Argentina, where they're clearing forests and so on. And they just realise that's a real liability for them. So they're actively looking for other ways of providing nutrition to the pigs and chickens. Yep. I am coming very close to the part of the discussion where I'll be putting your questions to our illustrious panel. So make sure if you have a question, you put it in the Q&A box. A few of you have already done that, so thank you. But I do want to talk about, um, Simon, the, the work that you're doing, the, the modelling, you kind of touched on it briefly earlier, but just sort of stepping us through the kinds of discussions you and your colleagues are having, the kinds of moving parts or levers that we potentially have to pull as a nation mm. and how you crunch those numbers? Yeah, how we crunch those numbers is uh, um, through some sophisticated models um, and the computers do a lot of the work, which is great for us and then where it's up to us to interpret them because uh, all models are wrong, sometimes models are useful uh, <laughs> is the standard refrain for, for modeling work. Um, in terms of the big levers that we can pull, and this was sort of highlighted in the way in which we went about creating our scenarios, um, we sort of wanted to look at, well, what are the drivers around on the demand side? What's going to influence the way in which we use energy? Um, and electrification comes through as the big driver there. Um, we, we are naturally going to get more energy efficient with a lot of our appliances, but the, whether we switch to using electricity in, in a lot of different uh, sort of transport cases or, or industry or in our homes um, is a big question that influences the way in which we use energy and, and the energy demand. And it turns out that it's a, it's, you, you actually get some really big savings through electrification. Um, on the supply side, um, I guess we sort of had two questions to big drivers. One was, um, well, yeah, what's the level of renewables that we want to deploy? So do we want a fully renewable system, 100% renewables? Um, was one is one side of that coin. The other is we're already looking at supply crunches and supply chain issues associated with COVID, Ukraine, um, just you know general the way in which the world's operating at the moment. So what if we can't build renewables fast enough to get to net zero in the time that we need? So that was sort of the two drivers on that side. Um, and hand in hand with that is the the lever of how much carbon removal do we want to allow ourselves to do? And by that, I'm talking about um, if the ag sector and land use can't get us to net zero or can't offer those offsets, the only other opportunity to remove carbon from the economy is through carbon capture and storage, um, where we're basically uh, either capturing carbon out of industry and putting it under, storing it permanently underground, 
or um, actually car capturing carbon dioxide from the air um, and storing it permanently underground. And so that was the other sort of lever that we were that we looked at to coincide with the level of renewables as well. Do you have an answer as to what the mix is going to be or should be? No. So one of the things about scenarios, and I think it's really important to, to understand when we're talking about the work, is that we didn't have a preferred pathway and we wouldn't advise for a preferred pathway. What we wanted to do is highlight if we pursue a lot of electrification, then this is what the future world looks like. Or if we pursue a world of 100% renewables, this is what the world looks like. Or if we believe that supply chains are going to crunch and we're going to need lots of carbon capture and storage, this is what the world looks like. So, yeah, we, I can't really offer any insights on, on what's more likely or what's the preferred scenario, only for, for folks to look into it and see, okay, well, what do each of those drivers, what are the implications for each of those drivers for Australia and for individuals? Ben, what are the big levers in the agriculture industry? So I, I think the biggest lever is going to be our export markets. There's already a really interesting example of that that I'll go through briefly. Um, the EU, we export canola, particularly from Western Australia to the EU. And the EU quite recently said, we think your carbon footprint of your canola, which is used for oil, is too high. We're going to stop importing from you. And the canola industry in Western Australia thought, oh, uh, we better work out what our carbon footprint is and how to lower it. And they actually did that. They got quite accurate carbon footprints and they could demonstrate they were producing oil at a lower footprint than they did in Europe. So all of a sudden that market was back open and they had increased access to that market. So I think that is going to be one of the big drivers or levers. It's a, it's a lever if you're a company um, uh, that sells food and so on. There's other interesting levers, and this is going to sound really trivial, but if we just bred cattle that were a bit smaller, <laughs> they would emit less methane. But do you get less meat out of them? Um, you can get efficiencies in the system because you can have small cattle that are highly um, productive. They have lots of calves over their lifetime, so the amount of beef is actually the same. But because that cow standing in the paddock is producing less methane, it actually reduces methane by quite a bit. So that's one, sounds trivial, easy lever. The problem is people don't like small animals. <laughs> well, we like, some, some of the us key. like big dogs or big horses and people tend to like big cattle. So convincing people to have smaller cattle is possible, but it's not straightforward. But that is a, a quite a significant lever that we could pull. And like you say- If it's... the signals were right. Right, but yeah. the, the canola example is such a great example of the global sharing of resources yeah. and if we're doing something efficiently here, then that's offsetting the carbon emissions that would have happened in Europe where they're yeah. farming there. And, and to build on that, I would, I would add that that's another, and a lever that I forgot, is how much of an export nation do we want to be yes. for our energy? Yeah. Um, we could, you know, the size of the Australian picture decreases dramatically if we choose to simply... Um, you know, get rid of our fossil industry uh, and not replace it with anything. But is that really a, um, is that something that we really want to be doing uh, in terms of the amount of, you know, GDP that that brings into the Australian economy uh, and jobs and all the rest of it? But it, but it is a potential lever that we mm -hmm. might want to be thinking about. Well, I do want to turn to audience questions because we have been asking for them. There's still time to submit your questions if you want to. You just hit that Q&A box. And... Um, Th Thobro is asking, um, what's being done to transition communities such as the Hunter Valley and central Queensland from their dependence on fossil fuels? Yeah, that's, that's a question that governments and local councils and everybody are grappling with at the moment. Um, there's uh, quite recently, I think there was some uh, local government work in the Gladstone region uh, in Queensland, um, but it, it, that, that sort of outlaid some of the ways in which um, these transitions can happen. I think we are still in the infancy of that at the moment um, in terms of the way in which it will play out and, and how we can go about transitioning um, the, these communities from you know, what they've known and done for a long time. Um, there will be overlaps and opportunities in some cases, in others there may not be. Um, and so, yeah, I, unfortunately I don't have any answers in that space at the moment, but there's still lots of good work going on. 
Someone's asking, do you really think that atmospheric carbon dioxide is more of an issue than biodiversity loss, deforestation, the impact of intensive agriculture and cropping and overfishing? Uh, I'm not sure. So it's an interesting question. Um, and that's a trade-off discussion that we need to have. Um, I think it's possible to work on uh, addressing both mm -hmm. at the same time uh, in positive ways. I'm not sure it's helpful to play one off against the other. No. Um, and I think actually it's much more helpful to think about how do we address both positively as we move forward rather than trying to say, oh, we can't do this because of this or we shouldn't do this because of this. What do we do together? And they're, they're so interlinked as well. Um, yeah, as the earth gets warmer, biodiversity is compromised and it's very difficult to untangle those things. Yep. Yeah. So I think working um, on all those things together is the answer. Yeah. Uh, Mikhail is asking, do you think that our behaviours as consumers will have to change drastically as we go forward, given that we live unsustainably now? And this is a big driver for why we're overhauling how we produce en energy, which has a huge economic cost associated with it. There's a couple of different um, inter like things interplaying there, but that's really what your work is, Simon. Yeah, um, and yes, it, and so I think the answer is that we will likely change our behaviours in the way in which we interact with energy. Um, whether that needs to be forced or encouraged, I think is an, is an open question. Um, but I think the, as, the, as the system develops, we will, um, we will start to interact in different ways. Um, you know, like people who've put solar panels on their houses probably use energy a little bit differently to they did before when they did before. Likewise, when they get an EV or when they put batteries in. So I think they'll go hand in hand. Um, in terms of the cost, we're looking at changing an entire economy, the entire global economy. So there will be a cost, but there's no point sugarcoating that. Um, but it's in order to address an issue which we haven't costed previously in terms of climate change and biodiversity loss and the damage that we've done to the planet and to communities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have something to add there? Yeah, I, I, I think there's examples where there's actually not much pain like mm. it, as the cost of EVs comes down, it's not that much different having an EV to a combustion engine car. And the car companies have actually done a tremendous job minimising the pain for us as consumers. And rooftop solar is maybe another example. It's mm. not that difficult to transition to having solar cells on your roof. And in some cases may solve yourself, save yourself some money. But in other cases, it's going to be a bit more hard. And you saw the example, uh, it was in the news, some of the news about Germany trying to put heat pumps in everybody's home, and that just failed because it was just too much of a, a stretch, too expensive, too much construction was required. It was too far a, a leap. So they, the German government stopped that. And building on the solar panels, well, I mean, Australians have the highest level of solar, rooftop solar deployed uh, per capita in the world. So when these things, when there are advantages and, and clear gains for these things, consumers will adopt them and will change their behaviours as well. And so, yeah, it's not all of doom and gloom by any means or all cost. Um, and there are, there are other little things that we can do too. So on the journey to getting an EV in, in the same vein as downsizing your cattle, downsizing your car um, and it, it is, is another really great way of, of you know, in terms of bang for buck, it's probably better at the moment to do that than it is to, to, to go and get an EV. That won't be the case for much longer. Um, and certainly the EVs are where we need to end up. But there are, you know, transitional steps that we can take that, that don't have as much pain associated with them. Speaking, and in some cases have advantages. Speaking of gas guzzlers, Shane's asking, what's the percentage increase in fossil fuel use, like diesel, to mine all of the critical minerals that we need in the time frames that have been set? Um, so that's, uh, we didn't act, the answer is it's small, but I don't have a percentage um, to be able to give. Um, as I said, it always works out that um, the carbon emissions associated with the producing of the renewable electricity infrastructure work out to be lower than what you 
the payback that you get from installing them and avoiding the use of fossil fuels when you're making that electricity. So um, I don't have a precise number to give, but it's it's the trade-off is there and it's worth it. A lot of these questions that are coming through via the Q&A are very specifically uh, targeted at um, Simon and less about agriculture. If you've got an agriculture question, please chuck it in the chat, but I will also just chuck you questions as well, Ben. But um, Kyle is asking, there's a lot of focus on the supply side mm. of the energy transition. Should there be more emphasis on strategies to reduce consumption or demand through energy efficiency? Yeah, I think they go hand in hand. And I think the, the measures to move towards electrification are in general a really good idea. Um, and, and our modelling shows that as well. When we electrify, we end up the final energy demand of the country is less than if we don't electrify as much. Um, the, the efficiency savings that we get through moving to electrification are, are you know, self-evident in that regard. So um, I think it's, yeah, they go hand in hand. It's, I think it's more easy to focus on the supply side because big projects, you know, big benefits, potentially big challenges, um, as opposed to a lot of small incremental changes that we can all make um, that feel like they might not add up to that much, but actually can, you know, really change the, the, the overall picture. It's the small cows. Yeah. It's incremental small cows, small savings. Small cars, yeah. you know, more efficient homes, more efficient buildings, um, you know, rethinking the way about transportation and rethinking industry as well. So, yeah. A lot of the questions, the theme that I'm sort of really hearing from people is that they want to know what they can do as an, at an individual level to be part of the solution, which really is necessarily a global government policy industry kind of effort if we're actually going to move the needle. What are, like, it's it's very disempowering to mm. kind of feel like it's it's very far away from me as an individual. What are some things that individual people can be doing I think for an individual, uh, learning about the carbon footprint, like we were discussing before, of different types of food, where your food actually comes from. And the, the great example that came up was, oh, we'll just eat more soy that you alluded to. And then you realise to produce more soy for everybody to eat instead of beef, you've got to cut down trees in the Amazon. So learning about where your food comes from what the impact of different types of food is, I think is really important. And if people can do that and then modify their diets accordingly, that's a good idea. How do you recommend people do that? Because honestly, it makes, you have to eat like, well, I eat several times a day. Yes, yes. It's, it, you turn your brain inside out, you're sort of doing calculations in your head constantly. Yeah. So I, I would hope that in the not too distant future on the packet um, or in the supermarket, they tell you, the carbon footprint of this vegetable or whatever, so we can very quickly make a decision, informed decision. But also just doing a bit of reading on where food in Australia comes from. And we're a wonderful country for producing food, but we don't produce everything. And some of what you buy, you'd be surprised where it comes from and how it's produced. And you might not be so pleased about that when you find out. So just doing a little bit of research is a good idea individual action from you, son? Yeah, so I, I, would, I would extend that from beyond, not just food. I think it's a great idea. And I think it extends to all of the products that we interact with, all of the products that we buy. Um, because this, I guess, the, the push back on the supply chains to encourage um, the producers to actually ensure that their supply chain is genuinely, you know, low carbon or green or whatever word, decarbonize, whatever word we want to use. Um, that then flows back into ensuring that the people who are producing those materials, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's a force making them or, or encouraging them to decarbonise and, and all the way back to where we get it out of the ground and, and how, we, how we manufacture it. So I think that's a really important way that individual action, putting pressure on supply chains through the decisions that we make. Um, and then there's the standard things of, we've already talked about, you know, electrifying, um, you know, reconsidering the way in which we, we move, um, the things that we buy, um, and, and how we heat and cool our homes. Probably more cooling our homes in a country like Australia more than, more than heating, but, um, you know, it, those are the sort of standard uh, technology sort of decisions. Yeah. One more question um, from the audience. Tom's asking, 
How do we propose to supply the grid with sufficient, sufficient capacity to power the nation after sunset, um, given that on any given day, um, you know, at the moment, 65 to 70% of the energy mix is coming from fossil fuel after dark? Yeah, so our study uh, did an hour by hour uh, sort of uh, demand supply balancing uh, across the year, um, taking into account a range of 60 different versions of weather days. Um, and so it's a combination of renewable electricity, energy storage, um, some gas-fired firming, decarbonized gas, so whether that be like a biogas or a hydrogen, um, running through our existing or maybe even some new gas-fired turbines to sort of smooth out some of that variability. Um, they're the, they're the, that, that's effectively the, the, the solution. It's a lot of energy storage, a lot more infrastructure, um, so maybe nine to ten times the size of the current grid on the East Coast would be necessary for the um, Australian national economy. And if, when we consider exports, it's about 60 times. So, and there's, you know, pumped hydro and batteries associated with all of that balancing as well. So it's very doable. Um, it's just, it takes a lot more than what we have currently because of the, yeah, the fact that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And all it costs is seven to nine trillion dollars. Yes, most of which should come from investment in our country from folks who want to access our energy for exports rather than that there's a much smaller fraction that that's actually the domestic picture or the national picture, I should say. Yeah, because I don't have seven to nine trillion on me at yes. the moment. So like if I as an individual am wanting to apply that pressure, these are these are decisions that governments yeah. and industries have to make. Um, I'd love to know from each of you, like what people can do to vote with, with their feet or put that pressure on, what action can they take after logging off tonight? So um, I, I think the, the immediate easy actions are those ones around technology changes. Um, acknowledging the fact that some of those things like EVs, for example, are quite a substantial, um, it's quite a substantial purchase for a household or so on. Um, what and I would completely echo Ben's comments about not just for food, but we need consumers need to understand the the supply chain associated with the with their products, and so I think pushing for bringing in those kinds of regulations, and in fact we will likely benefit from think you know the EU for example bringing in those sorts of things, and as we move towards um, uh, even carbon border adjustments and those sorts of things. Um, that would be the main ones that I'd think of, and also maybe reconsider air travel, um, which, which is, um, Should yes, <laughs> uh, particularly post COVID, um, I totally understand that. But um, yeah, I guess you know we've got a lot of opportunities for maybe not recreational travel, but um, for business travel and things like that. We've got a lot of technology options that are available to us now, and um, maybe reconsidering some of those is, is a way. There's there's lots of others. Ben. Yeah, again, just awareness and awareness that production in another country, for example, of beef is not the same as production in our country. So a lot of the figures you hear quoted for beef production about how much water is used and so on are from the US. And it's definitely not the same here. It's not the same in Brazil. So just awareness of how food is produced the different steps in the supply chain, I think is a, a good thing to start to be across. Another thing I would suggest is when you Google these things, look for both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. So you don't go down one path, get a, a balanced um, view on it, which is not always easy, but I think it's important actually. Uh, that's words to live by no matter what you're looking yeah. for on the internet. That is where we have to leave it for tonight. Thank you so much, Ben and Simon. And thank you to Vigya for also sharing her insights. And thank you for joining us. It's always fantastic to have our alumni join us from around the world for these events. This is our last UQ Talks for the year, but we look forward to bringing you new topics and panelists that will ignite your curiosity in 2024. Good night.